um, first of all, I'd like to introduce Matt Schaefer, who's um, an East Leeds Marxist and also just to publish his, his first book, um, which is on sale here, Children of the Sun. It looks fantastic, um, based in the 70s and 80s around politics of the National Front and um, homosexuality and Nazis. I'm not sure that's a very good summary, but it's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming uh, so early in the morning. I'm surprised there's anyone here. Uh, um, so, uh, I, what I want to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to start off by alienating you all by sounding like a liberal. Um, what I'm going to do is do the, the classic liberal introduction to a talk, which is, uh, should we want to make this more of a dialogue? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so if I, I, you know, you know, you know, if I had, you know, 40 minutes, I would be presenting a. a Rigorous and uh, you know, hermetically sealed position that you would not be able to touch. But as it is, I mean, uh, you know, we, we, I think we're both very, very interested in genuinely turning this into a conversation. I've got as much interest in, in everything that, uh, that, that people have to say as, as, as in what we have to say. But partly because, frankly, I don't know the answers to a lot of questions this throws up. The, the, the reason why I suggested this this topic is precisely because I don't necessarily know what I think about it. It's something that I, I, uh, I, I, I agonize about at various points. And so, so essentially I'm using you as a kind of um, therapeutic support group. Um, <laughs> so to start with, you, you know, the, the kind of obvious nostrum that we always cite uh, in, in, in leftist meetings on, on, on culture is that, you know, as, as Marxists, we don't, uh, you know, we don't judge or choose art by the politics of this is something that we've, we've said many, many times. We've also, um, we've also, and then, and then we go on to uh, Richard mention that Marx was a great admirer of Balzac. Um, <laughs> and we sit back and feel very pleased with ourselves. Um, uh, this, as we also all know, is a lie. We judge art by the politics of the creator all the time. Um, you know, um, all the time. Uh, you know, um, including in our own estimable journals. Um, um, and I want to suggest that on one level, this is not necessarily a cardinal sin. It makes perfect sense that the reflection of certain interests and approaches to the world as filtered through art, of course we're going to be particularly interested that there is going to be, if you like, a statistically anomalous blip of, of preference towards a, a writing that, 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 that is that the revolves around some of those concerns. That's no great surprise. Um, but uh, you know, I, I, I think we have to be able to kind of marry the fact that that kind of predilection that we, that many of us have, um, is also, you know, while sort of perfectly forgivable and understandable, is also in, in, in rigorous terms wrong um, and, and and throws up a lot of a lot of, a lot of problems. Now, this particular discussion goes one step further than that, I hope, uh, which is we're not just talking about the politics of particular writers. Um, we're talking about commitment. And this category of commitment is a very, uh, it's a very, obviously a very nebulous category, a very uh, complicated category. Um, but it does, I think, take that notion of embedded politics one step further and say that it is not simply that you view the world in a particular way, that you have a particular understanding of the world, but that in some sense, what you're trying to do with your actions, with your, uh, uh, with, your with, 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 uh, with your fictions, perhaps, but you know, with, with, with everything you do, that you're trying to intervene, um, uh, and that this this notion of commitment, that you are committed to change the world in some way, in some way, in some mediated way, um, to a certain extent, the the question of the intersection of politics and writing is quite banal. As I say, it, it is perfectly understandable that writers who have a certain view of the world will reflect that in their writing in ways that will appeal to us in certain, in certain ways. Commitment, <clears throat> if one wants to say, you know, as an activist, you know, I'm committed to changing the world in certain ways, and as an artist, I am committed to my art, and these are very different things, then, <clears throat> then essentially what you're saying is that that category of commitment cannot inhere when it comes to your art, but there's a firewall 
Now, there are some people who take this line. There are some, there, there have been historically some writers, artists, musicians who, who more or less do say this, who, who, who more or less do say, you know, that when they're writing, that's, you know, that that's a, 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 at a different level, that's a different kind of thing, and, and you can't apply those judgments at all. And I'm convinced by that. But equally, the, if you like, what would probably in some ways be uh, a, a, an obvious rebuke to that, which is, you know, of course your fictions uh, are, going to be, are going to be and should be committed, and that they should be a reflection of, you know, your, your good desire to change the world and so on. That simple uh, inversion of the art for art safe line is also unsatisfactory. So, so the question is, if you want to talk about committed fictions, what exactly are we talking about? How does this work, this commitment? Now, one of the ways in which um, the, the complexity of the notion can be thrown up is by talking about a couple of problems that are thrown up by it. And one of the problems, which I'm going to come back to at other points of this discussion also, is the, is the problem of response. And believe me, as someone who writes fiction for a living, response is always a problem. You know, because none of you ever get what I want you at. Always a problem. Um, there's a writer called Christoph Tsiolkas, uh, an Australian writer who wrote a very, I'm sure some people have read it, a very uh, provocative and, and lauded and simultaneously um, uh, denigrated book called The Slap. Uh, it's a like, young Australian writer. Now, the interesting thing about Tsiolkas, and I can't speak for him, I haven't spoken to him about this, but uh, speaking to people who know him, so Tsiolkas is a leftist. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's active around the, 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 the far left, the far left the, um, in, in Australia, he's a politically committed activist uh, around uh, issues, of, you know, all the, all the same issues that we share. And he, in some mediated way, clearly considers his fiction political and part of his commitment. Now, what's been very interesting is the response to this book internationally, because among some people on the left, this book has been lauded as a fantastic and provocative examination of the sort of post-diaspora condition in uh, Australia, uh, problems of different communities, engagement, um, uh, refugees, asylum seekers, and so on and so forth, uh, and indeed sexual politics. In other, uh, in other arena, uh, particularly among uh, some, some, not all, I stress that, but some feminist writers have considered this uh, a, a deeply sexist possibly even, you know, really kind of, really unpleasantly misogynist book around some of its depictions of sex and sexuality and so on. Um, now this is an everyday occurrence, obviously, people reading books in different ways. Um, but this illustrates one of the great problems of committed fiction. If your aim, and I'm not saying it should be, but if your aim is to put forward a certain line within the fiction, then the moment you have dissident interpretations of that fiction, because I know the office would be appalled at the thought that people were reading this as a, as a sexist book, um, then you've thrown up one of the great difficulties and problems of, 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 of commitment. And this is a problem, the writer has to have the humility, obviously, to be prepared to say, maybe I got this wrong, maybe there is something in this that, you know, I didn't intend, because this intent is not the end of the story, but that really cleaves against the direction I was going for here. Uh, and, and again, I'm absolutely not saying that's the case in this book, because equally, we need to be prepared to say, I understand your concerns, I understand that they're coming from a very good political place, but I'm going to tell you why I disagree with your reading of this book. And these were around the debates, for example, around the patches, white right, uh, exactly these debates. And, you know, many people on the left saying, I understand that you consider this a racist song and that you're angry with it for a very good reason, but I think you're wrong in this why. Um, so there's one problem with committed fiction. Another problem, although this is simultaneously a problem and a, and a solution, if you like, um, I think can be seen in the response to Pinter's political poems, um, which is a tongue twister that. Um, um, like, people will know, you know, Pinter, one of the you know, most lauded of our writers for the last Lord knows, 50 years, you know, 100 years, you know, considered, you know, uh, obviously someone with, you know, in some ways peculiar politics, but mostly very, very impressive, hard, uncompromising politics on a whole range of issues that we would completely agree with him, very brave, brave writer. Um, and because of his quality, because of how long he's been doing it, he is uh, fated by uh, the mainstream, by liberalism, by the kind of, if you like, culture industry, but not his poems. Not his poems. His plays, of course, is a genius, but his poems, oh, they're so vulgar. They're so crude. Um, because, partly because they use swear words, and partly because, 
at the level of political commitment, they are resolute, uncompromising, and yes, crude. He weaponizes the crudeness. Um, and, and, and there is absolutely no way of reading his poems against the grain. Children's his poems essentially, you know, being, you know, one line, I mean, his, you know, that, that say, you know, I despise Blair. You know, that is basically, <laughs> you know, deconstruct that, you know. <laughs> you know, you know um, and so there's, so there's, a, there's an exception clause when we're discussing things that like, we, you know, culture and stuff. Like, you know, yes, it's true, but not the poems because they're crude. Now, you could say, okay, well, if you've annoyed those people, you're doing something right, and okay, fine, that's very, that's, that's fun and rallying. But, you know, let's be self-critical. Is there, is there a question there? Is, is it, you know, to what extent does this particular committee fiction fail? I say this, incidentally, as a huge fan of the poems. I think they're amazing. I think they have to be read as part of a nexus of this whole work. I don't think you can read them in isolation, but I think they're amazing pieces of work. But I think we need to be... We need to take seriously this accusation of crudeness and whether or not it undermines the efficacy of committed fiction. Which raises the question. Um, thank you. Which raises the question if we're going to judge the efficacy, if we're going to judge how all these things work, what is it we're doing? What is committed fiction? What is it for? One of the ways I think we can examine this is by seeing what our opponents say about it. Those people who, some of us, are regularly accused of writing excessively committed fictions. Um, and, you know, so, okay, well, let's take that seriously. Let's see what the people who dislike what we do say we do. And the words that get thrown up a lot are didactic and propaganda. Now, I want to examine those. I want to take those seriously. Let's start with the principle of generosity and say, all right, well, this is me. Okay. Didactic, obviously, you know, you're, you're trying to teach people things. Now, I, I'm going to say pretty straightforwardly that with a few, a vanishingly few exceptions, I don't think any politically committed fiction is, is, is uh, uh, you know, of, of, of any kind of cultural traction is didactic in the way that its uh, detractors claim it is. Because, you know, um, it is very, you know, I'm not saying no one because you can find to think anything, but very, very few writers are genuinely going to believe that uh, a piece of fiction in and of itself is going to be able to teach the readers certain sets of facts and theories and critical analyses about the world. Uh, it may attempt to, I suspect it's going to fail. <clears throat> so, if, if anyone actually is setting out to read adaptive with fiction, they're, they're setting themselves up for a fall. But mostly the fictions which are accused of didacticism, what I'm saying is I don't actually think that's what they're doing. That's not what's annoying the people who are annoyed by them. So let's talk about this notion of propaganda. Well, you know, again, how many of us who write committed fiction genuinely think that that fiction is going to change people's minds? Now, the problem here is you can't do a controlled experiment because obviously what pushes people politically is a whole bundle of things all the time, the mess of totality. You know, you regularly hear people say, you know, uh, Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed, you know, made me an activist. And that's, you know, a wonderful. Um, a piece of phrase for a wonderful book, but you want to say, well, what were the other things going on in your life? What else were you reading? What just happened in your home? What just happened in your workplace? You know, uh, it, it, it comes from a, a lovely, comradely, loving place, but it's not wholly convincing that these books in and of themselves can do this. And speaking for myself, you know, even in the most overtly political fiction I ever write or I might have to write, like Iron Pencil, I do not honestly think that piece of work is going to convert anyone to socialism. I wish. But I really don't. I don't think that's what it's for. So, if it is unconvincing that these are what these fictions are doing, what are they doing? And my feeling is what they're doing, essentially, is they are waving a flag. They are waving a flag and saying, you cannot read this without knowing that this comes from a certain position in the world. I may not be able to convince you of my position if you disagree. You may not care if you enjoy the rest of the story, but you're not particularly interested in politics. If you come from broadly the same position, you may feel a great surge of delight at the recognition of a fellow traveller. But essentially what it's doing is waving a flag. And that is a political intervention. It's a very mediated political intervention, but it is an intervention, particularly at a point in which politics are becoming heightened, are becoming, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 critical politics are becoming mainstream, uh, and, and polit political uh, uh, politics is in the air. Um, <clears throat> There are, of course, different ways of 
trying to wave this flag. There's the obvious point about what you put in. You know, if you write, you know, a story about, you know, striking teachers, um, and you put speeches into their mouths about why they're right to strike, and I don't say this mockingly, you can do this very well as part of the story. Then clearly, that's one way you can write a committed fiction. You can also write a committed fiction in what you leave out. If you give your book to uh, readers and they come back and they say, look, I'm sure you didn't mean to do this, but this particular character is a terrible stereotype. You know, you're just replicating certain tropes and you, and you, you have to have the humility to come back and say, yeah, absolutely right, okay, I'm going to strike, I'm going to strike, you know, the uh, usurious Jew, you know, um, the, you know, the whatever, you know. Uh, we are all, and I'm very serious about that, we're all created by, you know, the ideological apparatus all around us. We are all activists in this room, but that doesn't mean we would be killing ourselves to think that we don't replicate some of these ideological tropes all the time. So you have, so it is as much to do with being willing to change things, to being as willing to take things out as, as being willing to put them in. And that is obviously going to change time to time. But, you know, there's going to be a moment in history in which, um, in which having something in is not going to have the same physical awareness as, as, as taking it out. And the interesting thing about this, also, this is one of these things where the mainstream will attack us for doing this because, you know, we're subordinating politics, art to politics and so on. But liberal and mainstream writers do this all the time, and, 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 I, and I salute those of them that do it from a, from, a, from a good place. I mean, one of the most, you know, moving things, that, you know, on, the, on these grounds that I've heard for a while was, you know, when the Ian Lightens, uh, uh, far away tree books were, uh, uh, not even books, were really work with me on it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they were reissued in the early 80s. Um, her daughters, very, very mainstream, sort of, uh, you know, uh, in, in really in no way red activists, you know. They got together, they looked at the books, and they decided to take out the volume because it wasn't nice. It wasn't nice, and there were, there were you know, young children from different parts of the world now. It wasn't, wasn't a nice thing to do. Now, how extraordinary that the kind of basic human decency of two completely apolitical people, uh, you know, just trying to not be nasty to their neighbours, is now a more radical and committed act than, the, than you know, Carol Thatcher, a kind of, you know, who's happy to talk about gollywogs in the middle of the BBC. I and mean, there's actually a debate about whether or not she should be allowed to get away with this. This is incredible, you know. So I think that that notion of leaving things out can also be important. One thing I don't have time to talk about now, but I would really hope that we will uh, and I really hope we'll talk about in the um, in the discussion is, is is efforts to express commitment in form. Because we've been talking about the content of, of, of the work, but obviously what we've left out is the discussion of the politics of form, you know, uh, radical modernism, experimentalism, surrealism, uh, indeed other other kinds, pulp fiction and so on. The argument that the reader may not understand the politics if you have it at such an abstruse level. If you see the point of committed fiction as being to, to wave a flag, then that does not in fact necessarily have traction as a critique. Because if you write something that is incredibly abstruse and no one understands, and then separately in an interview you make it clear that this is coming from a political place, you wave the same flag. So if you open the idea to com the commitments as being flag waving, it actually frees you up, paradoxically, I, I, I want to say, to being much more opaque about the obviously embedded politics of your fiction. Um, three things to close with in my perception. One is, talking about the commitment of the writer, I want to suggest that actually a much, much more important issue is the commitment of the reader. And that this is the way that... Um, that we are able to uh, you know, politically engage with a political fiction, we're able to politically read, enjoy, possibly even love, but critically engage with and politicize reactionary fiction. You know, the committed reader, I think, is able to do a far more, uh, at, you know, at, at a societal level, a far more um, impressive job of kind of um, creating political fictions, even out of fictions that don't want to share the politics of the reader than, than, than the committed writer. I think the committed writer may have a certain platform in, 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 in culture, and that's great, and that should be used. But at the level of genuinely kind of combatively theorizing fiction, it's the reader who has the main job to do, not the writer. The second thing is, I think it's interesting 
to kind of perform a kind of a emotional self-critique and talk about, you know, our delight and desire to read fictions that we can see we share the commitment of is the flip side of the anger of people who don't share our commitment saying, I didn't like this book, it was too political. And it's interesting to raise the issue, we know what our politics are, we know that we're intervening all the time. What is it, you know, is it mere, if you like, tribalism that we feel so pleased when we when we see something and we think, oh, one of us. You know, this is an interesting... I've used this analogy before, but it's a little bit like the old um, comedy show from, from the 90s, Goodness Gracious Me, Indian Dad, who claims everyone is Indian. Uh, <laughs> Superman, Indian, you know. Uh, uh, and, you know, we're a little bit like that as socialists. You know, we read something and we're like, oh, red, definitely red. <laughs> This is the worst sin in the world. I think it's kind of adorable. We all do it. <laughs> we'll raise the issue of why. And the final thing I want to just, just mention is this question of art versus propaganda, because it is, as you will, as you will know, you know, an absolute uh, given that art and propaganda are opposed. Uh, generally, this is claimed when, right, when, when rightists or liberals are critiquing writers of the left that you can't have art and propaganda. The interesting thing, because I haven't talked very much about the specific cultural conjuncture is that this is now shifting for the right. So you have, you have um, people who work for 24, you know, that uh, fascist television show, um, explicitly talking about putting forward policy ideas through that fiction. You have Frank Miller, the hard right comics writer, who's written this anti-Al-Qaeda comic, explicitly calling it a piece of propaganda. And I would suggest that those of us criticizing it from the left, which of course we must do, do not criticize it on the grounds that art and propaganda are fundamentally opposed, because that is a snake that will coil back and bite us again uh, in the ass a few years later. So anyway, I'm finished, I'm going to hand over now. Forgetting it and reading it. 
But as a reader, you are always just removed from your reader from really being able to imagine the system that it's talking about. And, and it's because, you know, being in this other way of thinking, this is a way of thinking that is unimaginable to us. Um, and it, it's hard for me as a reader of China's books not to see that as somehow relating to questions of the imaginability of other, other worlds in different ways. Um, and you may not think there's a connection there at all. Well, I just didn't know you were going to talk about my book. <laughs> So, in Socialist Review, um, Adam Penning is incredibly nice. 
and he said um, that it was, uh, I'm not picking this for the, for the blurb value, I'm thinking of the words. Um, he said it was a fascinating insight into fascist organizations and useful in helping to understand our enemies today. All right, so that makes his position very clear. There is no sympathy because these are our enemies. And there is a degree of empathy because we can understand them, but that empathy is okay because it's useful. So that's one kind of response. Um, on the other side, the Morning Star, Steve Andrew the Morning Star, despised um, my books. And he said, among other things, that the key far right characters, some of whom are real life figures, unfortunately come out looking attractive and charismatic. And what he's doing there is he's almost admitting to some kind of sympathy. There's no question of empathy, we're not really talking about how they think. Um, but he's admitting or suggesting that you know, the reader might feel some sympathy with the characters. And, and for that reason, for that very reason, the book is bad and undesirable. Um, I think those are both entirely legitimate reactions. I mean, obviously, and it seems to me that those kind of questions, um, you know, approaching politics, both of the reader and the writer, um, those are some of the categories that would be interesting to think about. And that's really the right question. Um, and 
I would approach it from that perspective. Um, Seth was asking about fascist readers. I have had some fascist readers. Uh, I don't mean right-wing readers like Telegraph readers, I mean like <laughs> Nazis. Um, <laughs> and I know this because there was a very brief thread on Stormfront, the fascist bulletin board about my novel. Uh, they hated it, but they got to the end. <laughs> <laughs> I was anxious about, about putting too much of my own politics in the book, and I, I, I had these huge rants about um, Islamophobia between characters that were, that were correct, but really, really awful in the context of the novel, and I was eventually persuaded to take them out. Um, I don't think that the politics are of good or less invisible in the novel, but when, uh, when it was proved read um, for, for typographical errors and so on, I had a note from the proofreader who was incredibly nice about it. He gave me all this correction and he said how much he liked it, how he thought I'd really dealt with the appalling fascist content. And I had a follow up the next day, uh, an email that said, God, I'm really sorry. I just, I just assumed you weren't a Nazi, and if you were, I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, a, a very light-hearted intervention as 
some ideological level about that, that particular literary trope, not about the political economic thing. Um, the three issues I would like to try and talk about for like a minute each. One is this question of the current moment. I, um, I agree with, uh, uh, with, with several people actually that it's, it is possible to be too, um, too pessimistic about this. I mean, I, 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 I've been lucky, I think Max has been lucky in the sense that neither of us have ever had the slightest pressure at all from publishers, from, you know, uh, you know about the politics in the book, anything like that. I actually think that, the, that um, my, my sense is that at a mass level, at a, at a mass readership level, you know, publishers, which are obviously capitalist industries, do not care one whit about the politics in your book. They don't care. All they care about is whether or not they're going to be able to sell it. And I also do not believe, in fact, no, I'm not talking, I mean, obviously some totalitarian regimes, you know, you know we're, we have the luxury of being a liberal democracy and so on. But, I think at a mass level, that's, that, that's a fact. And I think that readers, are, that there is almost no correlation between the amount of politics in a book and the question of whether or not it can gain a mass readership. I think the relationship is simply too complicated and contingent. So I, I kind of think it's, uh, you know, if anything, actually, I think now the time is slightly right because politics is in the air for politically invested fictions. I would suspect there will be more, not fewer. That's my prediction. Uh, and I, I'm not. You know, Pollyanna. I mean, I know publishing is based on loads of problems, but that particular one, not so much. I don't think. Sebastian's uh, point. Um, yes, I, I, I have. I don't know about any fascist readers. I, I have hard right Christian readers who tend to read my books um, through a theological lens. Um, and they do what we do about you know socialists, where we go, you know, Bazak doesn't realise it. He's actually a radical. Actually, one of us. <laughs> <laughs> Indian, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, Charlie Gilbert doesn't realise it. He's clearly a uh, Christian. You know. um, so, um, so yeah, I think there are. I mean, I, I think the question of succeeding artistically. My understanding of the of the Marx Trotsky type intervention is not that to succeed a book has to be read against its own intention necessarily. It's more, uh, you know, that that that, 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 that it, it, it can sort of escape the bounds of its, of its reader's intentionality. Um, I, I, I think you can fail politically, and I think, I think this is where humility comes in, and I do think this is also, I think the way in which I think it's very important that we do say authorial intention cuts both ways, that, that you know, authorial intent, that the fallacy that that's the controlling thing. Uh, yeah, as, a, as a committed writer on the left, you have to take seriously political critique from, from the left. You have to be open to the idea that you have messed this up that you have replicated something you shouldn't have replicated. Doesn't mean you have to just roll over. They may be wrong. Uh, but in a sense, you know, the point at which, I'm not inviting anyone to do this, but the point at which, you know, uh, you know, the articles start appearing on, you know, on the reactionary core of Chang Abel's novels, you know, um, uh, that might just be a kind of cultural confidence, which even if I disagree with the analysis, uh, is, is a good thing. And I should be able to grudgingly accept that the analysis may have a point sometimes. I hope not, but, but you never know. The last thing I want to talk about just very quickly is this question of censorship. This is a really huge issue, and I think I think that part of the problem on the left is that we, we, we don't discuss, I think we, we, a lot of this discussion um, gets really badly uh, kind of sidetracked because what we tend to leave out of it all the time is the issue of the state. If we're talking about issues of censorship and banning, the horizon is the horizon of the state. And so people say, well, you know, so if you're a socialist, you hate this book, do you want it to be banned? I mean, what do you mean banned? I don't want the state to ban anything. Absolutely not. And I think we have to be pretty clear about that. And that means, you know, think of the worst, most toxic committed fiction you can, the Turner Diaries, a diary written, uh, a book written by a white supremacist to recruit white supremacists that was a rallying call for uh, Nazi terrorists. Do I want the state to ban that? No. What I do want, and I'm perfectly happy to see, is people, activists, making it impossible for that book to be sold uh, in bookshops by grassroots activism. And I don't think this, you know, liberals will tell us that this is, uh, this is hypocrisy. It isn't at all. It isn't at all. A mass movement that makes, uh, that makes that something unsellable as a commodity is not the same thing as calling on the state to ban something. Yeah. It's a I think we have the novice 
stupid about this. We have, you know, for example, if you are, you know, a PhD student and you're studying far right movements, you're going to need to read the Turner Diary. So, you know, so yes, the, the, the copies are always going to be available. The question, well, what if you succeed and then no copies are available and someone wants to do a PhD? We'll deal with it. You know? <laughs> And that's a different category. So I think I, I think when we're having this, and this this censorship discussion is going to come up more, not less. And we need to be really hard about it, and we need to be really careful. I would suggest no one on the left should be using the word ban. I think that's the wrong word. I think we should be we should be talking about political interventions as, as part of creating a truly civilized society. Civilized societies don't ban, but what civilized societies do do is make it so that you know black kids and Muslim kids and Jewish kids aren't terrified by books that are placed in the bookshops every day. That's civilization. Yeah.